one nonfiction book that has absolutely nothing to do with the church. And this, this is how I've come to possess a menagerie of facts about the history of butter. Um, it's where my interest in the likely but not certainly extinct Colorado grizzly bear began. But the book and the subject that gave life to this tradition is American Canopy by Eric Rutkow. It is the history of the United States as told through truths. And it is fascinating. Who knew that the United States is a nation of trees? The, the U.S. has, of course, the oldest trees in the world. There are trees, there are bristle pines in the southern Sierras that predate the pyramids. Right? Just let your brains explode. The U.S. has the tallest trees in the world, right? In the redwoods, the thickest trees in the sequoias the largest living organism on the planet in the sand of Aspen, known as Pando, in Utah. And that's all very impressive, but it's not just natural history. The political history of the United States is also rooted deeply in trees. The very first coins minted in North America didn't have the faces of kings or queens on them, but trees. The pine tree shown was the first coin minted in the 1600s. In the 1700s, growing resistance to British rule centered around what they called the Liberty Tree, an elm just off the Boston Common. And it was America's supply of timber suitable for building mast poles that could help the British Navy keep up with the Spanish that drove British interest in maintaining colonial control. One of my favorite fun facts is that pre-independence, any tree in the United States, what would become the United States, it was greater than two feet in diameter, uh, by law, belonged to the king. You couldn't cut it down because he needed it for mass balls. And actually, they'd run around and the way there were people whose job it was to stamp all of the trees with an arrow, like a royal arrow, that sig uh, signified that they were trees that belonged to the king. And some of the first acts of uh, uh, disobedience where uh, folks would go down and cut down those trees or burn down those trees. As it often happens, my attempts uh, to escape uh, theology and church uh, have only led me back to it. A number of years ago, I took a group of students from Red Belonging to camp in New Mexico for a spring break trip. And there we spent time with uh, Dr. Ben Stewart, Dr. Stewart is the professor of worship at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago and the director of the Zion Center for Religion and Science. And over the course of the week, he led us to make connections between the natural world and the liturgy. There was a session in which we, we learned to start a fire with magnesium and steel while we consider the role that we reserve for real live flames in the liturgy. There was a hike to a waterfall and conversation about baptism. There was a session on the, the dustiness of the outdoors and Ash Wednesday. But there was also a session on trees. While it is generally a good rule of thumb to avoid sweeping generalizations of world religions, Dr. Stewart led by noting that many of the world's major religions have an axis moon deep, right? a center of the universe. Right, in Islam, there is Mecca around which one orients their body in prayer. In Judaism, the holiest of holies remains on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But Christians, on the other hand, have never had such a clear center. Right, there was a time in which we oriented ourselves to the east. Whether an old enough church in the worship space will face toward the east, the idea being that the east is where Eden lies and where we one day hope to return. But as you sit here, physically and on the internet, uh, you should know that you're facing north. Those days have passed. Christianity, of course, does not lack a center. Rather, the thing around which we are called to orient ourselves and our lives and the world is the cross. 
because they're us. Because the place where new life began, where death was defeated, the center of Christianity is wooden, built from a tree. But still, the literal, old, rugged cross of Jesus does not remain with us. And so perhaps we find ourselves still a bit lost, unsure of which direction our compass should point. The Gospel this morning is short and yet complex, confusing. For the sake of brevity, and in order to relate to you all of those critical and miscellaneous facts about the United States and the trees, I'll focus on just that first short saying of Jesus. The apostle said, increase our faith, and the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. As far as the teachings of Jesus go, it's pretty straightforward. A mustard seed is indeed very small. A mulberry tree is quite large. If you have the tiniest amount of faith, you can do miraculous things. Even uproot this large tree and throw it into the sea. But I have a question. Why would you want to throw a tree into the sea? <laughs> <laughs> right? I think it's worth asking. We could say, oh, it's a metaphor for these things you can't imagine doing. But why this metaphor? Why throw trees into the sea? Why does Jesus seem at least somewhat interested in moving trees around? Dr. Stewart's answer to his own question about where is the center of the Christian universe <laughs> answer that is quite compelling is that we should point ourselves and our energies across around which we could which should be our center of gravity should be the cross that is traced on the forehead of each one of us when we arise from the waters of baptism how that liturgy goes when you come up out of the waters the minister takes oil marks the sign of the cross on each of your heads and proclaims that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. And so it is we are called to orient our lives and our world around the cross that we find in the face of each and every one of our neighbors. It's powerful. It's a powerful idea But it's also, it's powerful because what it does, what that teaching says, is it's faithful to this teaching and parable of Jesus. That the good news, the difficult news, is that the center of Christianity is not locked into one place, into one time. The center of the Christian universe moves finds us where we are. It does not require pilgrimages across oceans. It only requires us to look around us, to open our eyes in the time and place in which we find ourselves. And if we are to take that to the image of the cross, to the image of a wooden cross, perhaps we could look the same, that every tree is the tree on which Jesus is crucified, the, the tree from which Jesus proclaims life. And so perhaps, just as real as the cross of Jesus is a cross that is the tree of the white out oak out on the green. On Saturday, this coming Saturday, Lutheran Campus Ministry, of, who, of which whom I am certainly the pastor, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> we will celebrate our first 75 years of ministry in Boulder. We started with that. We think, but Megan's digging in, we may 
couple things here. Number one, this is not our 75th year uh, ministry, because if you can do the math, it was 2020, and that was a terrible time to have a party, but people like big round numbers. Uh, and Megan, our program coordinator, has been doing a lot of research and has been over at Norland, and we may have actually started earlier than that, but that doesn't matter for where I'm headed here, okay? Still, we're having a party. Uh, it's going to be great on Saturday. Uh, and we will do so trusting and remembering that the promise, the, the promise that the life of God travels, it moves. And we're going to start our celebration at 3.30 with a bus tour. And we need to do that because in these 75 years, we have been all over Boulder. We began as the Luther Club that met in the basement down at Trinity Lutheran Church downtown. But then, in an effort actually to be closer to the Episcopalians, according to our records, we bought a house up on 14th Street. It has the lions up front. It's a frat house now. It's not a baby like this. <laughs> but after that, there was drama, as there would always be in our history. Uh, we were invited in 1964 when the other Lutherans built the chapel here. Uh, we were invited to join them in the chapel, and so we thought this was a great idea. It's a great space, as you all also discern. Uh, and so we sold our house on 14th Street, and as a sign of faith, we used that money to, we gave that money to the most uh, underprivileged of all of us, right? We gave it to the unserved, we gave it uh, to campus ministry in Fort Collins, uh, to CSU, people who really needed that. Uh, to dig it. <laughs> uh, shortly after we sold the building, though, we were uninvited from the chapel. So in the span of a quick year, we were homeless. We settled at what was the United <coughs> Protestant Ministry Center. It's now St. Thomas Student Center. Uh, they had earlier, before we moved, offered us the opportunity to be like real estate partners in it. Uh, but we missed out on that. We were renters there. But then, late 70s, we were again invited to the chapel, and this time it's stuck. It's stuck. And so we moved into the chapel, and, and things were so harmonious that we decided we only needed one staff person. And so Bob Stumble, you may know, everybody knows Bob, uh, was the Missouri City Campus pastor. He also served us. And so everything went great from there until it did. And in the late 80s, uh, they were forced that relationship fell apart. And so again, we found ourselves homeless and staffless. But then some lo uh, local Lutheran churches got together. And they pledged enough money to call someone halftime to start the ministry back up. And during the 90s, we worked out of what had then become the Mennonite Church on the hill. Before moving into a house on 12th Street that we rented, and then we moved inside the basement of Grace Lutheran Church until finally there was this beautiful relationship built. We were welcomed as partners here to say. I was recounting this history. To someone on our 75th anniversary task force. And when I finished, they asked a provocative question. Why does Luther Campus Ministry exist? I'd never really thought about it. But it's fair. Because in our 75-ish years, there have been many precarious each of these unexpected transitions, the fate of our work on campus stood in the balance. We've lost a house. We've lost the ability to have staffing. We've missed out on opportunities that might have provided a more stable future. We've endured larger church bureaucracies that have not always understood or appreciated our ministry, and yet here we are, 75 years. And the only reason I can come up with as to why Lutheran campus ministry still exists is because of faith the size of a mustard seed. In each of those transitions, when, when, when so much hung in the balance, a handful of people acted with faith that the tree of life, that the life of God could be uprooted and moved to a new place to a future beyond our past, washed in the waters of baptism. It wasn't the decisions of large institutions. 
There was never a groundswell of unconditional support. It was the faith of a handful of people, some of whom I know, many of whom I do not, who believed that the work of God might prosper in an unknown and uncertain future. And so I invite you, of course, to join us on Saturday at 3.30 for the bus tour, 5.30 for the program to celebrate the past in this partnership. But I also invite you to the faith Jesus proclaims. I applaud your courage as a congregation to listen carefully to how God might be calling you into the future. I applaud your commitment in this process to seek to orient yourselves your life together towards the sign of the cross on the forehead of your neighbors. And I urge you to be the faithful people for St. Aidan's that I find myself giving thanks for in LCM's past, who believed that a mulberry tree might be replanted in the sea, and that it might be the good of the life of God. Thanks be to God for those things for you. Amen. Amen.